This is going to be some things that people don't believe about God. Uh, number one, he doesn't always listen to their prayers. Psalms 5.1 says, A psalm of David, give ear to my words, O Lord, consider my meditation. Now, this is a good meditation, and it isn't like the meditation that people do in yoga and in the occult and in other stuff that lets unclean spirits in your body. Uh, this meditation is a good thing. If you meditate on the things of God, then it'll be like Isaiah 26.3 that says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. So a good meditation is thinking on the things of God. Psalms 5.2 says, Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King and my God, for unto thee will I pray. So Jesus is the King referred to in the verse, and Revelation calls him King of kings and Lord of lords. David says, Unto thee will I pray. And although David didn't know who Jesus Christ was, we do. The Bible says there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Not everyone directs prayers to God like David did. Some people call on their gods, plural, like the false prophets in 1 Kings 18. Psalms 5.3, My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee and will look up. So start out praying in the morning. God loves the prayers of the saints. He keeps them in bottles in heaven. But sometimes there is something between you and God that keeps him from paying attention to your prayers. A lost man's prayers are nothing. Uh, God may answer the prayer of a lost man. But when it comes to a relationship with God through prayer, God doesn't listen to them until they come to him for salvation. And this is something the lost world doesn't realize about God. Uh, they think they can call on Him to do whatever and believe that if He is real, then He should just do what they request. And God doesn't work this way. Psalms 14.1 says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And only a fool would demand God do something to show His existence. Uh, he has already shown you in the creation. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So God isn't hearing the prayers of mockery from a foolish atheist. I mean, he hears it, but he's not going to pay any attention to it. And just because a lost person prays a prayer doesn't mean God has to answer it. And just because we pray a prayer doesn't mean God will pay it any attention. If we are doing things to hinder our prayers, uh, I'm saved, but if I'm uh, committing sin all the time and not even trying to do better, uh, God doesn't have to hear what I'm saying. I mean, He hears it, but He doesn't have to uh, acknowledge my requests. And there are things that can hinder my prayer. 1 Peter 3, 7 says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Uh, Psalm sixty six eighteen. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. James 4, 3. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Meaning, you're praying for the wrong reasons. You're praying to get uh, y your own gain. And, and st instead of thinking about the will of God in your prayer. And uh, God doesn't have to pay attention to these prayers. And that's something that people don't want to believe about God, they hate to believe about God, is that He doesn't hear and answer every one of their prayers. And there are hindrances to an effective prayer, to an effective prayer life. God isn't going to give you everything you ask for. And if you're not doing what you're supposed to do, it can hinder the prayer life of any Christian. And people expect God to do what they say instantly. But he's, uh, He doesn't work this way. And unbelievers expect God to react instantly when they say something like, if you're really God, then make lightning come out of the sky or something like that. They think that God is working this way, but He's not. But the next thing people don't believe about God is that He isn't of this world. Uh, Psalms 5, 3, and 4 says, My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee and will look up. 
For thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee. Uh, looking up is the best posture of prayer in the Old Testament. Uh, looking up shows that God is up in the third heaven. He isn't of this world. John 8, 23 says, And he said unto them, Ye are from beneath. I am from above. Ye are of this world. I am not of this world. John 18, 36, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. If the world hate you, know that it hated him before it hated you. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. The friend of the world is the enemy of God. Uh, don't be consumed with the things of this world, but set your affection on things above. Look up. We are looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We are waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. And that's when we get a new glorified body from someone who is out of this world. Our vile body will be fashioned like unto his glorified, glor glorious body. And he is coming back to this world from another world. And he is going to snatch us out in a rapture. To take us where he lives, uh, where we're, go we're not going to need a better body. We're going to have a brand new body. Uh, we're not going to have the aches and pains anymore. And people don't believe God isn't of this world. They think he is worldly and just like they are. But he's not. And you can't make Jesus Christ acceptable to the world through contemporary rock music. You can't make him acceptable to the world by changing his character and the way he acts in Hollywood movies and making him act just like one of the guys do. Uh, you can't mold him to this world's beliefs through the new versions of the Bible. Uh, he is the Lord Jesus Christ, and he is the one who is out of this world. And if you portray him different in the Bible, if you portray him different than how the Bible says, then you have another Jesus. And he said, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And that's referring to the time of Jacob's trouble. Now, that's what's going to happen. There's going to be all kinds of people deceiving people, saying they're Christ. One of them will be the Antichrist. And you can already see it happening a little bit. I just was seeing the other day some weird uh, fake preacher named Joshua or Joseph Hamilton. People are claiming he's Jesus. Uh, but there's all these people claiming to be Jesus. And people have the wrong Jesus. They have the Hollywood Jesus. They have the contemporary crowd Jesus. But number three... Another thing people don't want to believe about God is that He doesn't take pleasure in your sinful pleasure. Something the world doesn't believe about God is that He is against their wicked sins and they think they are all the children of God, even though they have never believed the gospel. And they think God is okay with what they're doing as long as they aren't hurting anyone else. Psalms 5, 4 says, For thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee. And God may allow lying spirits and the devil to approach him like he does in Job 1. But evil won't dwell with him. They can come around for a minute, but they can't stay. If you're not born again, then God sees your standing as evil. Not only is your state evil, but your standing is evil. In Luke eleven thirteen, he even calls man evil. In Genesis, he says the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. According to Genesis 8.21, God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but he is angry with the wicked every day. He is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But he takes no pleasure in darkness. He takes no pleasure in pride. He takes no pleasure in envy. He takes no pleasure in gossip. He takes no pleasure in pornography and rape and incest and homosexuality. And he'll be long-suffering with sinners, but he has no pleasure in their sinful activities. And even Jesus would say, go and sin no more. And the Bible says, she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth, in 1 Timothy 5, 6. So why would you want to spend your life having pleasure in something that is killing you? Uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, 12 says that they all might be damned, who believe not the truth, but had pleasure 
in unrighteousness. The Bible talks about in Romans 1, it names off that long list of sins and says, Who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. You can have pleasure in watching someone else sin. But God doesn't have pleasure in watching you sin. Number four, something else people don't believe about God is that God hates. God hates some things. Psalms 5, 4 and verse 5 says, For thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. And if he hates workers of iniquity, then he actually hates some people. And as much as that rubs me the wrong way, I'd have to deny the verse if I said otherwise. And I'm not going to deny the verse. You have to adjust your beliefs to fit the Bible, no matter how much it rubs you the wrong way. However, on the other hand, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So Psalms 5.5 5 says he hates workers of iniquity, but John 3.16 says he loved the world. The Bible also says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And the Bible also says we love him because he first loved us. So how do you reconcile these verses? Pastor Denny Castle said it perfectly when he said, God loves and hates the sinner at the same time in a way. And he illustrated it like, the feelings some people have in a bad marriage. God may hate, but he loved them enough to die for them anyway. And it is one of those things I don't fully comprehend. And maybe you do, but maybe it is one of those things we'll understand at the great white throne judgment. And I don't know how to look at it any other way. The verse said God hates workers of iniquity. Uh, it doesn't say he hates their works. It's, as much as that's what we humans want to read and believe, it said he hates workers of iniquity. And when witnessing to a lost person, I'm not going to mention the hate of God, but I'll mention his wrath on them and their sin. You need a balance on this subject. You don't want to deny the verse here in Psalms, but you also don't want to take it to an extreme and spend more time preaching the hate of God and how God hates this person and that person more than saying God loved you so much that he died on the cross to pay for your sins. Uh, to teach a lost person that they are a child of God and that God loves them how they are is a philosophy of the world. Uh, God doesn't like them how they are. They need to get born again and be saved. Number five, something else people don't believe about God is that he is to be feared. Psalms 5, 6 says, Thou shalt destroy them that speak leasing. The Lord will abhor the bloody and deceitful man. There again it says abhor. And if you look that up, it means to hate extremely. God abhors the bloody and deceitful man. Proverbs six nineteen says, He hates a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. So while it isn't a pleasant subject to believe and talk about, it's there. And I'd rather make people mad at me over sticking with the book than to reject the book and make everyone happy. And reading verses like that doesn't make me happy. Uh, some things that are in the Bible will cut you. And that's one of them. Uh, Psalms 5, 7 says, But as for me, I will come into thy house in the multitude of thy mercy, and in thy fear will I worship toward thy holy temple. Uh, the world doesn't understand that they should fear God and be scared of his power, and what he can do to them. Uh, Psalms 111.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And a good understanding have all they that do his commandments. His praise endureth forever. So fear isn't just respect. It's actually being fearful, afraid of God. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God, according to Hebrews 10.31. And our God is a consuming fire. And if you weren't ever scared of going to hell, something is wrong with you. And who sends you to hell? Jesus said, Fear him who was able to cast both soul and body in hell. 
And he has that power. Not man. The fear of man bringeth the snare. But God is, has that power to send your soul and body to hell. So you need to wise up and fear God. The next thing people don't believe about God is he leads you in the right direction. Psalms 5.8 says, Lead me, O Lord, in thy righteousness because of mine enemies. Make thy way straight before my face. Sometimes as Christians, you don't even know which good thing you should do or which way you should go. And this is when you ask for God's leading. But many times as Christians, you don't pray about something and it goes bad. Uh, you don't believe deep down that God is going to lead you in the right direction. That's something people don't believe and don't realize they don't believe about God. And the lost world doesn't understand that Jesus is the way and he leads you in the right direction. Matthew seven thirteen and 14 says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Now, if Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, then he puts me in the right direction. And many people see the trail of money and fame and everything else, and they follow the world and let it lead them. And they think they'll lead the way, and Jesus will tag along with them because he's just okay with all the wicked stuff that they're doing. But fellowship with God involves doing things God's way and letting him lead. Jesus Christ is the head, not you. He is the head of the body, the church. He's the head of the church. You're not. Uh, Romans 3.10 through 18 says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asses under the asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And this matches Psalms 5, 9, where it says, For there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is very wickedness. Their throat is an open sepulcher. They flatter with their tongue. And no wonder a man's breath stinks so bad. Look at what the Bible says is in man. The Bible is against man, and that's one way you know that God wrote it. Notice in those verses I read in Romans 3, everything about you is bad. And if you're not born again, then that is how God sees you. He sees you as unrighteous, and you need the righteousness of Jesus Christ applied to your soul. Everything about you is wicked. You need to be born again and made new. Then even after this, after you're born again, your flesh is still wicked. But you're promised a new body at the rapture. Number seven. The next thing people don't believe about God is that God puts people in hell. Psalms 5.10 says, Destroy thou them, O God, let them fall by their own counsels. Cast them out in the multitude of their transgressions, for they have rebelled against thee. Matthew 10.28, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And people don't want to believe it, but God destroys people. God will let you go to hell. He will let you be tossed into the lake of fire for eternity and never get out. And I was watching these videos of people being sentenced to life in prison, and you can feel the fear and agony of the people who are about to be locked away for life. And I thought about being in the presence of Jesus Christ at the great white throne judgment and hearing him say to someone, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire. Can you imagine the fear and agony when Jesus gives you the eternal sentence in hell fire? But the Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe in eternal hell. And some people think, this is all the hell that we're ever going to have is right here on earth. And they think that we're all the child of God and that, and that everyone is, is perfect in the sight of God. And they think even their dog is going to heaven. Uh, but there is only one way and there is only one gospel. And these, goes, these people going around saying dispensationalists believe in three gospels for today and they, they just have no idea what they're talking about. There is only one gospel and that is that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And Psalms 511 says, But let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy. 
because thou defendest them. Let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee. Notice that phrase, because thou defendest them. Jesus Christ is our defense. 1 John 2, 1 and 2 says, My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The blood of Jesus Christ is my only defense against hell, sin, and the devil, and nothing is done in my own strength. He will defend us from the accuser of the brethren. He'll keep you out of hell. God puts people in hell, but he also gives you a way out. Psalms 512, For thou, Lord, will bless the righteous with favor, wilt thou compass him as with a shield. And Paul said, If God be for us, who can be against us? A born-again believer's soul is sealed by the Holy Spirit, and nothing can break through. It is stronger than every shield any soldier ever had, stronger than all the shields in the world put together. Psalms 115, 9 through 11 says, O Israel, trust thou in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. Ye that fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. But this has been seven things that people don't believe about God.